Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody. Today, uh, we are talking to Rana Lubash, and today we'll be talking about fiduciary banking. Rana, welcome to the show. Matthias, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Happy to be here. Yes. Good, good, good. So let's dive right into it. Our audience is oriented toward probate and trust. And obviously, when you enter that world, especially as an executor, an administrator, you are going to hear the word fiduciary banking. So tell us what is fiduciary banking? Okay. Well, at Manufacturers Bank, we have this niche, this fiduciary banking. And what we do is we're very comfortable with the legal documents. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen special needs trusts. We've seen probate, administration, trusts, um, successor trustees. It doesn't throw us for a loop where many of the other banks, you know, the parents pass away. The kids who are successor trustees go into the bank and they're like, oh, we, we've got to get it reviewed by legal. We'll get back to you in two weeks. You know, we, mm-hmm. we don't know what to do with this. We are comfortable with it. We are comfortable with two signatures required. So if a trust requires that the two siblings or, or whatever they are must act together, we can actually set up the bank account that way. And most of the banks, I've been in banking more than 35 years. Most of the banking banks got away from that probably 30, 25, 30 years ago. So we can do that. We've had situations where the home has sold, it's in escrow, and the people can't get a bank account open. This was at the height of COVID. So it's like, nope, we can go meet with the people. We can meet in their backyard outside with masks on, and we can get it done and get it done quickly. That's wonderful. Now, for somebody who knows nothing about this, fiduciary banking in itself, why is it needed? Because some of our audience has never even heard of the terms fiduciary banking. So can you tell us the difference between a regular bank account? I go to the bank and I open a checking account. And when instead I am tasked to open a fiduciary account, a trust account. So what, what is the difference? You're, you know, a bank account, if you're opening up for yourself or your own living trust or a business it's your own money. That is your funds. You can do with it what you'd like and you can lose it if you'd like or do or write checks and do anything. If you're acting in a fiduciary manner, so we have either professional fiduciaries or successor trustees or administrators, Mm -hmm. when you're acting in that capacity, it's not your money. Yes, you might be the beneficiary of some of that, but you are acting on someone else's behalf. So you have to go with the utmost of caution. Mm -hmm. You have to keep things FDIC insured. And sometimes the court papers will specifically say the accounts need to be FDIC insured, which we can do that up to 150 million with a product that we use. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we, it's Intrify and we place, basically place the money in other institutions. So our clients don't have to go from bank to bank to bank and right. also get you know, 50, 1099s at your mm-hmm. end and all of that. So you're acting on someone else's behalf, whether you're professional or not professional. A lot of the times the trustees we're dealing with, they've never done this before. Right. They come, here's my documents. What are you, you know, and we have to guide them. We have to specifically say today I had someone where does it say it has to be two? So I'm reviewing the legal documents. It's like, this is something you should probably go ask your lawyer. They're the ones who set this up. But right. they don't, they need to be guided through because a lot of these times, let's say it's kids of, you know, grown, grown children of their parents. They've never dealt with this kind of money. They have to collect it from um, various institutions. They're selling homes. 
could be sale of business, liquidating stock portfolios. So there's usually a lot of money to be gathered coming into the bank. They need a lot of guidance from us, also guidance from their legal counsel, because you know, they're the ones right. who are helping gather the funds. And I think that's that what you bring up is actually a very important point. It's not just when somebody comes to you, Rana, it's not just about the fact that you know you help them with fiduciary banking, but you can also tell them who they should ask that question to. Like exactly the example you said when they yeah. say, Why do I need the signature? And you're like, Well, that's a question for your attorney. You know, yeah. ask the ask the person who set up the trust, you know, like why yeah. why it's set up that way. So that's very important. In the in this world of fiduciary banking, can you give me an example of, of like your typical client that, that would come to you and how would they arrive at, at you? Because manufacturers bank, even though you know as a presence, it's not your typical Bank of America was Fargo. Yeah. Somebody would have to seek you out unless they already have a relationship with, with your bank, right? Yes, yes. We're not on every street corner, we don't advertise, we're not, you know, we're pretty quiet, call ourselves kind of a boutique bank. Most of our business comes through estate planning attorneys. We work with them a lot. We go to conferences that we're at. We're involved in the San Fernando Valley Business Journal. Mm -hmm. So we, we are with a lot of estate planning attorneys. I'm in provisors and have met a right. lot of estate planners there and get a, a good deal of my business there. We've also gotten from realtors, we get also, um, sometimes there's a divorce and there's mm -hmm. two that sold the house. The two can't get along. There's a court order that it be in a blocked account. We've done that. So most comes from our relationships with the estate planning attorney. Yeah. So we work so closely with them. And that makes sense. That they makes are, sense. They're our client. So you know, we keep in close touch because if they refer us someone, they're giving, they're saying, you need to work with Rana. She knows how to take care of you. I need to really take good care of the client, not only for that client, but because my referral source is the one, you know, sent them to me and gave the trust in me. So right. I need to make right. sure that we Perfect. perform. Yes, that makes total sense. Yeah. Now, let me ask you another question, which is rather specific. What can me as a professional fiduciary, so those who are listening, who find themselves either, you know, not professional, actually, maybe if they're just like successor trustees and 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 the situation is that in a blocked account, uh, like you mentioned, what are the things that I can't do in a block account? In other words, you know, in a typical example, like you, we talked about at the beginning, you deposit, you know, $10,000 in this account. Are there any check and balances? What prevents? Absolutely. The, right. Absolutely. And so, 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 so let's talk about those. If it's two signatures required account, what we do is we set it up to, it's a vague term, but post credits only. The okay. clients, anyone can deposit at any time. Wires coming in, checks, everything. So deposits right. go through. Every check that's written kind of kicks out of the system. It doesn't go through because I'm sure you know banks don't review every single check. Right. It's random right. checking. So these accounts every check is reviewed. So it will actually kick out. Human beings have to look at it and say, these are the two signatures. These are match our signatures. Right. And we've got both of them on there. We can pay the item. Right. Otherwise, if there's one signature on there, it will not get paid. They'll probably notify me as the account officer and say, you know what, do you want to contact the client? We get something in writing from the other party and get the item paid. If it's a wire transfer, we just had one where the um, estate was closing, they were paying out beneficiaries. Our two trustees or, or administrators had to go into the bank to send the wires and they both had to be there to sign or they would have to you know, send us emails. We confirm with both parties. And it's clearly like in our bank system, two signatures, you know, it, it will it will put out warnings. So they can't, someone can't just go into one of our branch locations and withdraw funds. Very good. That that makes that makes total sense. Because you know, you hear this term, you know, it has to in court people, you know, and we tell this a lot to clients that are purchasing property that are in probate and in trust in my world. And you know, they're like, well, how do I know that they're not going to run away with the 10%, you know, before we have to, and we always we always have to explain, you know, these are these are deposited into blocked accounts, et cetera, et cetera. There is really, uh, this is a niche that is very, the knowledge is very specific and there is 
rightly so, I guess, not very many people know about it because unless you are dealing with these circumstances, you, you don't really know about it. So when generally it protects the beneficiaries, these are the people that ultimately will get the money. Sometimes the, the successor trustee, most of the time the successor trustee is one of the beneficiaries, but you know, in your typical scenario, maybe there are five kids, everybody's yeah. getting a percentage of it. Um, and they all get along perfectly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like anybody, every family does. <laughs> yeah. If anybody spent any any time in in probate court, as I do, uh, some of these uh, scenarios are very similar to Jerry Springer's. Those shows, uh, you get to see that in court. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. I remember if, in a few occasions where where we were quite entertained by siblings arguing in front of a judge, and, uh, and they'll argue over like pennies or yeah. something ridiculous, and and these some of these families put the D in dysfunctional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and let me tell you something. I remember one 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 case where where one of it was it was five siblings actually, and one of the they were all in front of the judge, and one of one end at the other end was like, "Dad didn't love you as much as he loved me." He literally said that oh, in front of the judge. I was like, "Oh," and and I hear it all the time. It's like, "Oh, Dad sent you to medical school. I should get more money." La, la, la. Oh, yeah. all, all or, or this one wasn't successful, but this one was. So we got to take care of the, the yeah. one who's not successful. And it's yeah. like, yeah, reward the <laughs> reward. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your journey. First of all, where did you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles, was born oh. and raised, lived in Pacific Palisades, nice. um, all through school there. Then I attended Pepperdine University. Oh, I always wonderful. liked to stay by the beach. Yeah. Um, worked for a little while, actually, at a law firm. Okay. And um, just it was a temp job that ended up going longer. And mm -hmm. then I, I got my MBA from Loyola Marymount. I married, no children except four-legged children. I'm a crazy there you go. person. And live in Calabasas with my husband and my dog. And Very nice. I haven't yeah. traveled too far from, from where I grew up. <laughs> that's, that's, that's wonderful. What was your journey to, to Manufacturer's Bank? Well, I have been in banking over 35 years. I started oh, wow. at a bank that's no longer here, Security Pacific Bank, in their management training program. Okay. I learned every aspect of banking from tellering to everything. Um, was there for a couple of years. And then I went on to Union Bank. And I okay. was there for 25 years. Oh, wow. Uh, retired from there, have a pension from there, which is a lovely thing to have. Yeah. And I was in the private banking area. And so worked with high net worth individuals. I had my securities license, Series 7. I have life insurance, all of that. And, you know, it's funny because back then, you know, I was there from the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Trusts were becoming, you know, much more mainstream. It used to be only highly wealthy people had them. Right. But we were doing the trusts. We were doing the life insurance trusts. and. So I had, you know, your basic knowledge mm -hmm. of trusts uh, and that. From there, I was there 25 years. I went to Pacific Western Bank and I was there for five years. And it's always a friend. It was actually through provisors. I met someone who was at manufacturers and he asked for my resume and uh, the rest is history. I've been there three and a half years, learned a lot about trusts and law and I go to a lot of training. I've done, you know, some of the seminars, some of the conferences where I've sat in on the courses. Some of it's way above my head. Some of it's um, understandable. And I'm like, geez, I should have gone to law school after, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not too late. Right. So I've been there and, you know, I still can do my regular business and I do have that. I work with doctors, lawyers, mm -hmm. Um, real estate owners. So I have regular accounts and do that too, and lending. But this niche, it's interesting. And and being in a networking group such as Provisors, mm -hmm. it helps a lot having a niche that you work with because people will say, ah, I'll think of her for that. Right, and I right. was at Pacific Western and I was doing you know just the traditional banking. And I, you know, we're bankers, we do lending, we do, I would get deals from people that were, you know, someone who, oh, I filed for bankruptcy five years ago. Can you give me a loan? My bank turned me down. It's like, no. <laughs> so I was getting a lot of those kind of referrals where 
when you have a specific niche, people will think of you for that. Yes, they might think of you for other things too, but it's like, yep, this is this is the person I need to call for this. That makes total sense. I, and I agree. I agree. I think, you know, like uh, me as a realtor, I, I do what every other realtor can do, but having, having specialized in trust and probate, as you work within the niche, you realize there is so much to learn just about that particular thing that, you know, becoming an expert and it, and it really takes a long time. And so, you know, the fact that you, you're a banker who can, if somebody says, you know, I need to open an account, you know, net worth, high net worth individual that needs help, you can help them. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you know, you can, you can also help somebody who, who, who needs to get into fiduciary banking in that case. Yeah. Yeah, and you, I'm sure you've seen having that niche really helps, you know, this is the person and you have to become an expert at it. I mean, you don't have to know everything about it, but you need to know what to look for yeah. when to seek advice. Um, there's times where I, you know, I will refer back to the attorney who referred it to me. He might have written the deal or he's administering it or mm -hmm. and say, can you please explain this? You know, or sometimes we need to get it reviewed by our legal. And right. we've even had, you know, where our legal speaks to their their legal and we get it clarified because sometimes yeah. it's not a hundred percent clear. Yeah. So. You know, speaking from from years of experience in, in this world, I can tell our audience, and, and as I'm sure you know, it makes a world of difference to have somebody at the other end of the phone who knows what you're going through and can assist you. People feel overwhelmed when they are dealing with probate. And the same thing, you know, generally speaking, we all arrive in the in, in the world of trust and probate because of a, of a loss. Mm -hmm. And so having the people who know what they're doing can make the process so much easier. So, And as you know, it is a growing business with America right. aging, you know, they're, we're losing more and more people. They're living longer, but, yeah. you know, there's still, there's there's going to be more deaths going forward. And yeah. this this field is a growing field and um, it's important. I, I agree. I agree. Okay. So I'm going to do something now that I love doing. I'm going to tell you, I have a list of, I have a list of questions. They are all numbered from one to 30. And I want you to pick one number. And I will, these are questions that come from talk shows and things like that. So they're just so we learn a little bit about more about your personality. So okay. can you pick a number from one to 30? Uh, number 10. 10. Okay. If you could have an endless supply of any food, what would it be? Chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Oh, you knew that right away. You were of like, of course. Oh, don't even ask. Don't yeah, even ask. chocolate's happy stuff. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> okay, let's do another one. Pick another number from one to 30. 21. Okay. What is the best Halloween costume you have ever worn? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Halloween's my holiday because I actually met my husband on Halloween. Oh, really? Oh, yes. that's great. Uh, when we were 15 and 16. And so, okay, tell, tell us. We, we are on that now. You got to tell me. How, okay. how, how was it? How was it? Okay, so Halloween? we met up in Mammoth Ski Area okay. and met through a mutual friend. Mark, my husband's family, had bought a condo up there. Okay. And a girl I went to school with her with her family. So they were buying together. And she invited me to go to Mammoth. My job, I've never been, and you know, was I went up on Halloween, uh -huh. and we, you know, they were moving into the condo, and so we were going to be setting up and doing stuff and everything. So we had not expected to go skiing. I'd never skied in my life, and it was early snow. And uh, Mark thought I was cute, and so he was flirting a bit. And so yeah. we he took me skiing, and I had never skied before. And I was in jeans and a sweater, oh. and I was falling, <sighs> and I was wet and cold. And he was like, "Oh, honey, I'll keep you." <laughs> <laughs> he was very smooth back then, and he had a girlfriend. We were in oh. high school. He he had a girlfriend. But he oh. broke up with her on Monday morning and then called me Monday evening and we've been together ever since. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. What and a great ski, story. And we still ski and um, oh, that, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do one more uh, okay. since the, the, that one brought up a very interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go with number 30. If you could be a professional athlete in any sport, what sport would you choose? Not football. I hate being hit. Uh, let's see. <laughs> a gymnast. The gymnast. gymnast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why yeah, that? Why, why a gymnast? It just, it's so pretty to do all the flips and craziness and fly through the air. And it not that I would good, do right? it. But... Yeah. But if you could do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rana, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. It, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Before we let you go, I see you have your contact information on the screen. Thank you so much for that. We will have all the contact information in the show notes for anybody who needs to get a hold of Rana. Um, tell us, um, is, is everything we have on the screen, is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, um, email is good. Um, yeah. Cell phone, because I'm always out and about um, meeting with clients. You know, most of our people don't come into our offices. We go okay. to them or if they're far, we FedEx it or email documents to them. So I'm out and about. So cell is good. Email's good. I get back to people pretty quickly. So Wonderful. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I'm I'm so happy about that story, the Halloween story. That's <laughs> that's just that's just great. And the fact that he had a similar to my story because when I met my my wife, she had a boyfriend. So it was, you know, it was like a reverse mm -hmm. situation of yours. But you know what you, what you do when you meet the right one, you just make it happen, right? <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody for joining. I will see you on the next episode. And as always, uh, Rana, you've been wonderful. And that's it, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye.